we move now into the 20th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. And will you notice, the Lord Jesus apparently came back from the dead on Sunday. Notice this, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, under the sepulcher, and seeth a stone taken away from the sepulcher that was the first day of the week. Now she came to the tomb, and when she got there, it was yet dark, and she seeth a stone taken away from the tomb. Now she had no thought that he was raised from the dead. She had come out ahead of the other women, and when she arrived, she was probably halfway to the home of John, you see. They got there ahead of any of the disciples that came. As far as I can tell, they actually didn't intend to come out. Now then she runneth, and she cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And this is John, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid him. Now, thing that she had in mind was not resurrection. What she had in mind is somebody has moved the body and put it somewhere else. Now, the thought of Peter and John, I'm sure, is this. Well, this woman went out early in the morning, probably went to the wrong tomb, and she saw the stone rolled away, and she became frightened and ran. That was their thought. And they went into the cemetery, and friends, Peter and John did not expect that he was raised from the dead. They did not believe it, because you don't go into the graveyard to look for the living. The living are not in the cemetery. But I think there's some walking around today that probably just well be in the cemetery. But that is something else. But certainly, you don't look for the living in the cemetery. And they were not looking for the living when they rushed out to the cemetery. They expected that they would find the body. We're told here, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, and they came to the sepulcher, verse 3. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Now this other disciple was John. He was a younger man, and he could outrun Simon Peter, who was a much older man. And when he got there, that is, John did, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Now, friends, this is very important to see because what John saw convinced him that Jesus was back from the dead, though he did not see him at this time. All he saw was the evidence that is there. And it's amazing how God uses little things like this to bring conviction to the hearts of many. Someone has said, great doors swing on little hinges. Well, I think that one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection is what you have here, something that probably the average person might have passed by. Now, notice what happened. He, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lie, yet went he not in. Now, this man, John, a younger man, had a certain amount of reticence, and I think a certain amount of reverence. He didn't go in. But then cometh Simon Peter following him, and I think he came up puffing and blowing this older man. I tell you, it was hard on him to run, but he didn't have the reticence that a younger man would have, and so he went into the sepulcher, and he seeth the linen clothes lie. And not only that, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Now, what did he see that caused him to believe? We're told that he's stooping down. He saw the linen clothes lying. Well, what about those linen clothes? Well, we said a few moments ago that when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried the Lord Jesus, that is, put him in the sepulcher. They made a mummy out of him. 
they wrapped that linen around him. And as they did, they put in this myrrh and aloes. Now that myrrh and aloes formed a sort of a glue that had sealed in the body. And how would you get a body out of there without unwinding all of that? And you can imagine what disarray they would have been in that tomb had that happened. Now, what actually happened, the Lord Jesus came up out of that just as a seed. And you remember he used that figure of speech, just as a grain of corn falls into the ground, except it die, it bideth alone. But if it does what? It comes up, and when it comes up, and up on top there'll be several grains of corn, just like the one that was put in the ground. But what happened to the one put in the ground? It just happens to be down there. That is the form of it is down there. The shell of it is left down there. And so all that was left in that tomb was just that shell that he'd been in. But he wasn't in it. He'd come out of it. Now you remember that when Lazarus came forth from the grave, when our Lord called for Lazarus to come forth, he said, unloose it. Why? He was tied up in those grave clothes. He said, unloose it. Undo all of this. But when the Lord Jesus, he left all of that and he came forth in a glorified body. And this, friends, was resurrection. Now, we are told something, and this is another one of those small things. You know, it's amazing how God uses small things like this to change the destiny, actually, of this world. And recall that back yonder in the time of the slavery of the children of Israel in the land of Egypt, you will remember that little Moses was put into an ark in the bulrushes. And at just the moment he cried out, the little fella cried, I think the Lord pinched him, if you want to know the truth. Lord pinched him just at the right moment. And what happened? Well, Pharaoh's daughter was over there and heard it. And God brought together a baby's tears and a woman's heart. He changed the destiny of a worm. One night, a king couldn't sleep, and he didn't have any aspirin tablets handy that night. Bear wasn't making them then. And what happened was that he called for the records of the kings to be read. And they read in there that this man Mordecai had done the king a real service, and he hadn't been rewarded. That's a good thing they read that because that very night there was a gallus being built to hang Mordecai on. on. And believe me, the king's not going to permit that. Now, it may seem a little thing that a king can't sleep, but my friend, God used that to change the destiny of a people. And God does that. And here you have the same thing. Here's the napkin even lying in a place by itself. And now we read folded. What does that mean? Well, it means that it was in the shape of the head, just as it had been folded around the head, there it was, just like the head was in it, but the head wasn't in it. He'd come up out of that, and that was the thing that had convinced this man, John, that he was back from the grave. He saw and believed. May I say this is inside the empty tomb, and if you have any doubts, I invite you inside the empty tomb, take a look yourself. Here's evidence that's ordinarily passed over. Verse 9, now, for as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. This is important also to see. They knew not the Scripture. What does that mean? Well, they had heard him say that he was going to rise from the dead. The Old Testament had spoken of this. And what does it mean, they knew not? It means exactly what it says. You know, there are a great many of us that have read the Bible, and we've read certain scriptures, but we actually do not know them. I've discovered two things about the Bible. One is that many times I read scripture and see things I never saw before, and I've read some of those passages many times. That's one thing. And then there's something else, and that is that I have an experience. And some scriptures that I did not know their meaning until I experienced them. And that has a lot to do with the trials and the sufferings and the experiences of this life. And that's the way you know it. You see, when David wrote, the Lord, 
He is my shepherd, I shall not want. He knew what he was talking about from experience, by the way. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, here again is something that is quite interesting. She didn't know him either. Now, we have seen before that Judas didn't know him, but Mary didn't know him. And you know why she didn't. The reason she didn't was simply because of the fact that she did not believe he was back from the dead. Unbelief is blind, and unbelief is dumb also. You remember that fellow Zacharias at the birth of Christ? Why, he was dumb until John the Baptist was born. Why? Well, he didn't believe. Unbelief is dumb. Jesus saith unto her, notice this, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. What concern she had, and yet she did not recognize him. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. That's all he had to do was call her name. Have you ever noticed the different ones that he just called their name? Even when he raised the dead, he called them by name. It's my personal belief that at either the rapture or if he takes you out, the rapture comes in your lifetime, that you will hear your name call. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they know him, and they follow him. And when he calls, and I think he'll call them by name, he calls her now by name. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And I think there are two things there that we should mention. One is that he said, Touch me not. And later on, he told the disciples in the upper room to touch him. Why? Because he said he hadn't ascended to the Father. That's the reason she wasn't to touch him. Well, then apparently he had ascended. I believe that the Lord Jesus presented his blood at the throne of God, and that has turned it into the mercy seat that it is today. And I do not think that is crude. There are those that have accused me of being crude by making a statement like that. I contend that that blood was shed for my sins, and the only thing that is true about it is your sin and my sin. I think the blood will be there to tell us throughout eternity the price that was paid for us, and that is the reason. And you notice what he said, I have not yet ascended to my Father, but I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. You see, his relationship to the Father is different than our relationship to him. We become sons of God in faith in Jesus Christ. And he is a member of the Trinity. So he makes that distinction here. Now Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she'd seen the Lord, that he'd spoken these things under her. Now, friends, we come to the 19th verse of this 20th chapter. And we're coming now to the conclusion of the Gospel of John. This 20th chapter deals with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw that Mary Magdalene came first to the tomb. And by the way, if you want the order of his appearances, you should have our book 
on Matthew. And we would send that out to you if you want to order the book. And any gift you make to this program and order the book, we'll, of course, send it to you. But we have in that the order of the resurrection. And he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. However, when she got there, why, all she found was an empty tomb. And then she told Peter and John, and they came running, and they looked in, you will recall, and the thing that John says is that he saw and believed. Now, it wasn't just a cursory glance. The word here to see means he inspected the inside of that tomb. And he concluded that the Lord Jesus was back from the dead. That was the only explanation of how he could come out from and under those linen clothes wrapped around and sealed in with a hundred pounds of ointment. And that meant that he had been raised from the dead. And there was that form just as if the body was in it, but he was not in it. And John saw and believed. And then we have the appearance of the Lord Jesus to Mary there in the garden. Now, it wasn't because he looked so differently, although he was in a glorified body. It wasn't because of that she did not recognize him. The thing that caused her not to recognize him is this. She just didn't believe he's back from the dead, friends. And that's the explanation. When he spoke, though, and called her by name, she recognized the voice as only he could speak. And I'm of the opinion today that if the Lord should tarry and all of us go through the doorway of death, that our bodies will be raised when he calls us by name someday, just as he called those that were here that he raised from the dead 1,900 years ago. We come down now to the next appearance, and it is to the disciples who actually are frightened and they are hidden away and they're hidden away in a room. The doors were shut and actually locked. Verse 19, and I'm reading that now. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now this is the peace that he speaks when deity touches humanity, when the supernatural touches the natural. And this is his word to them. This is the peace that comes being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the kind of peace he's talking about here. Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now, you see, they knew him when he appeared to them there in that room. Now, he came in, and the doors were shut and barred, These men were frightened, of course, and afraid. And now that he appears to them, it means he came through that door in a glorified body. I'm of the opinion, and I don't want to get detoured here, and I'm not, but may I make this comment? I wish that probably I could sit down with you today, and now that I'm retired, I might have a little more time and just sit down with you if I could be there with you in person and discuss the resurrection body. There's a great deal that we can know about it and a great deal we do not know about it. Here he was able to come through a solid wall without any particular difficulty at all. The glorified body is a body that apparently is not subject to the laws of a material universe. And that's my reason for believing that when the rapture comes and our bodies are changed, if we're alive and we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, there's going to be no problem then. It won't be necessary to be put on a space suit and get in a capsule and be shot out into space from a launching pad. 
we'll not need that at all. Bodies that are not subject to the laws of a material and physical universe. That would seem to be the great lesson this year. There are two things I ought to say, and they may sound like contradictions. They're not. It is a paradoxical statement. I think we are going to be amazed at the great change that will take place in the new body that we're given. The second statement I want to make is that I think that we're going to be amazed at the little change that will take place. Now, that may sound like a contradiction. It's a paradoxical statement because, will you notice, though he could come through the doors, he says now to them, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. He showed them his hands and his side, nail prints, so that there was a strange similarity to that body that had been nailed to the cross. The scars were there. I do not think that there'll be any scars in our body, and I'll tell you why. Those scars that he showed them are scars that he bore for us, and I think he'll bear them throughout eternity in order that you and I might be presented without spot or blemish before him. He took our sin, and this will be the evidence of it, by the way. There will be a striking difference in the new body, a striking similarity also. Now will you notice, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Now I do not want here to draw a parallel that is not here, but I think that this is a different peace that he's talking about here than the peace he mentioned when he appeared to them in the room. He said for them at that time, peace be unto you. That's the peace of redemption, peace with God. And here, this is the peace of those that are in the will of God, that are in fellowship with God, that are doing his will. Now, we have that in the invitation that he gave in Matthew. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll rest you. That's the rest of redemption. That's the peace of redemption. Then he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, this is a peace that comes to those that are in the will of God. This is what he talked about, Father, when he said, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And this is what he had prayed about over in the 17th chapter, in verse 18, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And this is that which comes through fellowship and obedience to him, my beloved. And this is another peace, therefore. And I do not want to make a distinction that's not here, but I'm confident that he's just not repeating himself. Verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, you must recall that these men are in an interval between his death and resurrection and the day of Pentecost. He had told them in his ministry that they were to pray about this, by the way. We make so much of this word he gives on prayer, but if you go over to the 11th chapter of Luke, ask and you receive and he that seeketh findeth, him that knocketh shall be open. Well, what's he talking about? Well, in verse 13, he says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Well, they never ask, you see. They never ask at all. And you find out that a little later on, there in the upper room, you'll recall in the 14th chapter, verse 16, 
He said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. They didn't pray, but he did, you see. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. Now, I believe that right now, these men have been regenerated before, but these men had not been indwelt by the Spirit of God. And he said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm coming to you. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And the day of Pentecost has not yet come when they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, which means they were put in the body of believers, the church. The church came into existence on that night. So in this interval between his death and resurrection and his ascension back to heaven until the day of Pentecost, this is for that. He says, now receive ye the Holy Spirit. And he breathed on them. That's an interesting expression. That expression doesn't occur anywhere else in the Bible. You find it in the Septuagint way back in Genesis where it says, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Now, that's exactly what he's breathing into these men, the breath of eternal life, the Holy Spirit. And this is that interval between his ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit. In other words, his going and the Holy Spirit's coming into the world. Therefore, you cannot put this down on today because we're not in that interval today at all. The Holy Spirit has already come. He's in the world today. Our Lord has said that already. He would send him and he would come. Now he says something else. Verse 23, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto him, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now this is, I believe, again, a very important passage of Scripture. And again, I think that it's greatly misunderstood. I'd like to give a quotation from John Calvin in this connection, and here it is. When Christ enjoins the apostles to forgive sins, he does not convey to them what is peculiar to himself. It belongs to him to forgive sins. He only enjoins them in his name to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. That is important to see. Now, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Now, you will not find anywhere in the book of Acts or in the epistles any instance of any apostle remitting the sins of anyone. But they're doing exactly what John Calvin said here, our Lord meant by that, and that is to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Or let me put it like this. What is it that forgives sins? What is it? Even God just can't arbitrarily forgive sins. We have forgiveness of sins through his blood until Christ died and paid the penalty for our sins, God couldn't arbitrarily forgive. And back in the Old Testament, their forgiveness was based on the fact that Christ would come and die. Or, let me put it like this, God saved on credit in the Old Testament. And when Christ came, he paid the penalty. And today, you and I look back in faith. Now, it's only the gospel that has in it any forgiveness at all. So how can you and I remit sins? We can remit it by preaching the gospel. And I'm amazed at that, as we saw in the 14th chapter. Greater works shall ye do, says, than even he had done. And you know what the greater works are? Well, when he was here and proclaimed the word and somebody believed and turned to him, that to me was not a great miracle. But when Vernon McGee, gives out the word of God and somebody turns to Christ and is born again and becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. And we have instances now on this radio of literally hundreds 
that have listened to the Word of God and been born again. We have literally now and filed hundreds of letters. We know what the Word of God can do. My friend, that's a greater miracle when these lips of clay can just give out the Word of God. That, my friend, is whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted unto them. That is, when you proclaim the gospel of the grace of God. And that's the reason that's the most glorious privilege there is today, friends, is to declare the gospel of the grace of God. Now, this was a wonderful appearance of our Lord yonder in the upper room to the ten. Not twelve, but only ten were there. Not just eleven, but ten. Why? Verse 24, but Thomas one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. I've often wondered why he was not there. I do not know. I can merely surmise. I can merely make a guess. And I rather think that Thomas was a doubter. He had a question mark for a brain, as we've seen, always casting a gloom on every situation. And I think, very frankly, the reason he wasn't with the ten because they were all talking excitedly about Jesus being raised from the dead. And why wasn't he with them? He didn't believe it. And he forgot the assembling of themselves together, and he wasn't with them. But now word came, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Boy, is he a doubter. He's got enough evidence to make him a believer, but he's not. Now, our Lord appears again, and so he, Thomas sticks by the others. He said, I'll be here if he appears again. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Thomas was there, friends. Now I'm reading again. Then came Jesus, the door was being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you again. You see, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, that is, be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And friends, as far as the record is concerned, he didn't reach forth his hand and touch him. He didn't have to. You know, there are a great many people who say, Oh, if I could only handle, if I could only do this. That's not the problem today. There is the evidence. The problem is not with the evidence that is available today of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the problem is in the human heart today. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And this is one of the great statements, one of the great confessions of Scripture. At the beginning, there was a doubter by the name of Nathaniel, you remember. And Nathaniel fell down at that time and called him the Lord and my God. And now Thomas, at the end of the ministry of our Lord, does that. Verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. There is a special blessing on those today who believe the evidence that is for the death and resurrection of Christ. Now we've actually come to the end of the gospel because here is the statement, and this is the main key, I think, to the gospel, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Again, I call your attention to the fact our Lord did many things that are not recorded, many blind men multitudes of those that were deaf and dumb, multitudes of those that were sick with fever, multitudes of those that were crippled. No doubter in that day could deny the fact that he was doing these things. Now, these are written, John says, for a purpose, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing 
ye might have life through his name. Now these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he is the one that died for your sins, rose again, as it's recorded here. And when you do that through believing, you have life. You're born again. You become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That brings us to the end of the gospel. But somebody says, wait a minute. Here's chapter 21. Now, friends, as we come to the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, it's an epilogue. It's an afterthought, something that was added apparently after the Gospel itself was concluded. There are three incidents that are recorded in this chapter. There's that fishing experience on the lake, and then there is the breakfast on the seashore, And then Jesus announces the death of Simon Peter, and he calls him to service. In the first incident, the fishing experience, we see that he's to be the Lord of our wills. Breakfast on the shore, he's to be the Lord of our hearts. And then when Jesus announces the death of Simon Peter, he is the Lord of our minds. Now, we see here these men are out, well, they go a-fishing. And I'd like for you to see this lovely chapter because I think it, again, is one of those wonderful chapters that we have here. It's there at the Sea of Galilee, and so much that's connected with the ministry of our Lord before and after his death and resurrection is connected with the little Sea of Galilee. Now, it's a familiar spot, therefore, a very popular spot. It's the most famous body of water anywhere. Now, will you notice, we read verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee, and on this wise showed he himself. These are the circumstances. You remember he asked them to go up into Galilee, and there he would appear to them. Now they've gone there, and they are waiting. And we are told there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Friends, this is an amazing group that you have here. I like to call this the convention of the problem children. There was Simon Peter, fervent but failing, warm-hearted, and yet walking afar off, a man who was so impulsive and impetuous, yet affectionate and yet failed. Then there's Thomas, that magnificent skeptic who had a question mark for a brain. And then there's Nathaniel, He was a doubter also at the very beginning. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He's a wise cracker too, by the way. And he makes that wise crack. And believe me, he in just a few moments was down on his face before the Lord Jesus. Then there was the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And these are the problem children. Have you ever noticed? This is the meeting of the problem children. And there are two other disciples. We can speculate who they are. Let me make a suggestion. You and I are maybe the other two, because if you have problem children, maybe you and I should be put in the crowd. Now, will you notice it says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Now, will you notice this? Many very worthy commentators condemn these men. They say they shouldn't have gone fishing. Simon Peter shouldn't have said that. Well, the Lord Jesus did not rebuke them when he appeared to them. He didn't say, well, why didn't you wait for me? And it's Bishop Ryle who wrote, I see no harm whatever in Peter's conduct in this particular incident. 
Now, they were there by his commandment. He told them to go to Galilee. And it was springtime in Galilee. It's the Easter season. Warm zephyrs from the south that made ripples near the shore and there were white caps out on the Sea of Galilee and the surrounding hills were green and there were wild flowers in profusion. You say, how do you know? I was there a few days after Easter several years ago and this is the way it was then and I suppose 1900 years ago was even prettier than it is. And we're told that they entered into the ship. I do not know whose it was, but that boat was idle. It was their boat. And I think they waited and waited and waited. And Simon Peter would be the one to become very impatient. He'd paced up and down. Finally, after he'd waited and looked up and down the show and said, well, the Lord hasn't come. And he just blurted out, I go a fishing. And six others voted yes. They did not, friends, sit down and twiddle their thumbs. I think idleness hurts the cause of God today more than anything else. You can never catch fish while lying on a feather bed, and you cannot throw a net from an armchair. And we have today very many armchair coaches. They're Monday morning quarterbacks. They're bleacher umpires. And by the way, they're pew preachers. And when I say pew, it's P-E-W, but it can be spelled the other way. There are many today that can sit in the pew and tell the preacher how he ought to do it, you know. Thank God that there's some that get up out of the pew and they go out to go fishing for him today. And maybe they do blunder. Maybe they didn't wait for orders, but thank God they're out doing something for God today. And very frankly, we have too many fundamentalists sitting on the sidelines who are actually doing nothing to get the Word of God out, but they're criticizing. God have mercy on their souls. Now, these men went out, and I want to say to you, our Lord never condemned them for that. But you know what happened? They went into the ship, and they fished all night, and you know how much they caught? (laughs) They caught nothing. And Dr. Scott always said, This is the failure of the experts. You see, these men were piscatologists. That means they sure knew how to fish because that's the way they made their living. They knew all the methods. But that night a failure was in the plan and purpose of God for them. You'll see that God says today that we are to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And that rivers of water is the word of God and that we bring forth our fruit in our season. We don't always catch fish, but we ought to be fishing. We live in a day when everything is measured by the yardstick of materialism. Mathematics is the language of success, and statistics are the inspired word today and the Bible of the world. And I guess I'm as guilty as the rest of them. We always like to give numbers today, and... I must say, on this radio program, we more or less measure it like that. But they didn't catch a fish all night. And that just added to their impatience, their disappointment. They were restless at first, and now they're more restless, and frustration has seized them. In fact, now we have the frustration of the problem children. You know it's easy to fish when you catch fish. It's difficult to fish when you're not. That's the reason I've always sympathized with old Noah. He preached 120 years and never had a convert. I would have quit long before 120 years. It would have been 120 days, and I would have turned in my resignation to the low one. But here, will you notice, we find that they've had this bad night of fishing, but it's morning now. Must have been a glorious morning there at the Sea of Galilee that morning I was there. I just felt like shouting when I thought of this incident. Verse 4, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. I think that it's a very normal experience this is, because they're out there in the sea, and it's a long ways off. Then Jesus saith unto them, and I think they're coming in shore now, 
Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, no. <laughs> he asked a question I think that he's bound to ask every one of us someday. Did you catch anything? What did you do for me down there? And we're going to have to answer, and I hope we won't have to answer as they did. They said, no, we haven't caught a thing. He said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. You see, the whole thought here is he directs the lives of his own. And now when they fish according to his instruction, the nets fail. And that, I think, is very important to see, friends. And the net is filled with fish. And it didn't break this time because they are fishing now with a net that's strong. It's a net that is the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and their witnesses to those things. Now, when this took place, therefore, verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, he saith unto Peter, it's the Lord. You see, he had a spiritual perception that Simon Peter didn't have. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fishers cord upon him, for he's naked and he cast himself into the sea. And he must have been a hundred yards out. He was a good fisherman and he's a good swimmer, by the way. Three years before, he'd called them at the same spot, I think. And they went back to fishing and he called them again. And now he's back calling them again to fish for the souls of men. And it won't be hook and line fishing. And the other disciple came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishing. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all, there were so many, yet was not the net broken. You see, he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. The power of a lifted up Christ, the weakness of the church and the impotence of the church right now is, it's not holding up the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, will you notice what he says here? Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? It's not hook and line fishing. You see, it was a net and it was not broken. <laughs> Danger is to allegorize this entire episode, and I think the net represents the gospel. And we have that in Matthew 13. There was no gospel but the teaching of Jesus when the net broke, you see. Now it's the death and resurrection, and the net did not break. Gospel not only saved, it'll hold you, friends. And then you have his purpose for believers is to keep them, even in failure. They can come, and they're kept by the power of God through faith. And that is the statement of Simon Peter in 1 Peter 1, 5. And we have his purpose for believers. It's to direct their lives, all the details, cast the net on the right side. And what you have here, you see, is this great purpose that he has in this. He's the law of their wills. And now they have breakfast on the shore of Galilee, and he's the law of their hearts. Now, if they're going to serve him, their heart must be right. Will you notice now what takes place here? And this is a very wonderful thing that takes place. Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. And now they're having breakfast together. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. That's verse 13. And now verse 14. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that, he was risen from the dead. 
So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Now what we have here, three times, we have the Lord Jesus interrogating this man. And he takes Simon Peter. He's calling this faltering, failing, fumbling disciple to service. And three times our Lord interrogates him. Why three times? Well, he responds three times, and three times Christ gives him the commission. Why three times? Well, Simon Peter denied him three times. And Simon Peter's call to the ministry after the miraculous catch of fish. Simon Peter lost the ministry at a fire of coals, and here's a fire of coals now at breakfast. But it's similar, but not identical. Three times, this is the mechanics, three times Christ questions this man. Interrogation. Three responses of Simon Peter. Affirmation. And three exhortations of our Lord. Will you notice here? I wish I could have heard the Lord Jesus speaking to Simon Peter and say, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And the three words in the Greek here are very important. And the word he uses here for love is the highest form, agapos. That's the highest and noblest word for love. And Christ chose the higher word. He says, do you love me with all your heart? Salvation, you see, is really a love affair. We love him because he first loved us. And the supreme word in religion is love. I would have chosen faith. Now abide of faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. You know, it's a greater compliment to be trusted than to be loved. Faith will die when the object proves unworthy, but love lives on. Simon Peter failed, but the Lord no longer could have confidence in him, but he loved him. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend, but God commandeth his love toward us, in that while we were, we were sinners, we were ungodly, we were without strength. And we love him because he first loved us. More than these, now there are two ways of reading that, more than these things that are here material things, or more than these other disciples. I'm of the opinion that he means more than these other disciples because Simon Peter had boasted that he's willing to lay down his life for it. Now, when Simon Peter answered, he didn't say, you know that I love you. He used a different word, phileo, and that is, I have an affection for you. Why didn't he come up to where the Lord was and say, I really love you? Well, he's already boasted before and he's afraid to do that. And he says, Lord, you know my heart, you know this. And the exhortation is, be grazing my lambs, the little baby lambs. Now, some people think that he really said, be criticizing my lambs. That's the way we do it in California. That's the California version. But he really said, be grazing my lambs. Give them the word of God. Then he says here, Simon Peter again in verse 16, lovest thou me? Leaves off more than these. And then Simon Peter's no longer boasting, you see here. He'll not come up. He's grieved at this, you see. He says, you know that I have an affection for you. In other words, he's saying, you know my heart. And then he says, be grazing the sheep. And the sheep need feeding also, you see, as well as the lambs. We have a little book. We're sending it out to those who support the program, by the way, and I Sorry that we have to make it like that, but we do because of the type of operation that we have. We have no promotional program. We just say to our folk, we depend on the gifts of listeners to continue the program. And when a book is included, we must say you have to send in something to support the program. And that's the reason we do it, friend. But I have a book on this particular incident here, and that is this incident with Simon Peter. This is the secret of service. 
It's, do you love him? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And one of his commandments is to go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. And somebody says, I don't love him. I think, frankly, he'd say to you, then forget about taking the gospel out. He wants you to love him, friends. That's the most important thing of all. And that's what he's saying to this man, Simon Peter here. This is the secret of service today. And if you love him, that's all important. All important. It's more important than anything else. He's the Lord, not only of our will, as we saw in the fishing, but he's the Lord of our affections, of our heart. And he today wants your love above everything else. Now, we come here to the Lord of the mind. Now he says to this man, Simon Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, walkest where thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. He's telling this man that he's to become a martyr. He said, I'll lay down my life. Well, he's going to now. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me, you follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? This man, Simon Peter, has got to ask a question. Peter seeing himself to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Well, it's actually none of his business, and that's about what our Lord tells him. It's none of your business. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what's that to thee? Follow thou me. Now, he didn't say that John would live to the rapture. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. He wants, my friend, to be the Lord of your mind as well as of your heart and of your will. And today he's not Lord of your life, unless he is the Lord of all. And as someone has put it, unless he's Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And I think that is true. Let me read the last verse of the gospel. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself did not contain the books that should be written. Amen. That's not hyperbole. It's not an exaggeration. Believe me, we're talking about the one who not only died upon the cross, rose again from the dead, but my friend, he is God the Creator. And the world wouldn't hold the books of the things he's done. Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. 